Hello, I'm Peter Okwacha. Welcome to Focus on Africa, our top stories. Lesotho's Prime Minister bows to pressure to step down amid a political crisis over the murder of his estranged wife. A calming of the waters, Egypt, Ethiopia and Sudan agree an initial deal over the Grand Renaissance Dam. We find out why it still costs so much to buy basic foods and goods in Ethiopia despite its rapid growth in the past decade. Also on the programme, Facing the Music. We meet the woman from Senegal standing up for her right to rap, wearing a veil. And in sports, the Africa Cup of Nations and World Cup qualifying dates are swapped by the Confederation of African Football. Thanks for joining us here on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Lesotho Prime Minister Thomas Tabane is stepping down. His spokesman has confirmed it and an official public announcement is expected tomorrow. The country has been in the grip of a political crisis lately. Uh, that's because the First Lady is wanted for the murder of the Prime Minister's estranged wife. But Maisaya Tabane is nowhere to be found. Police also want to question the Prime Minister about the case. Diplolelo Tabane was gunned down two days before the inauguration in June 2017. She had just won a court case for the right to be called First Lady. Tabane's decision to step down is not entirely unexpected. He had been facing calls to resign both from within his own party and the opposition. Well, joining me is Rapalang Radebe, a freelance journalist who is in the Lesotho capital, Maseru. Could you just take us through why exactly the Prime Minister has decided to step down? Greetings from the Mountain Kingdom. Yes, indeed. I, I think this follows, not to mention that he's already 80 years old and I think ultimately has decided that it's about time the pressure is mounting, it's just too much. But if we take it back a little, you'll realize that his party, ABC, also a all Basuto Convention Party, uh, had a conference about a year ago, which elected a new committee. But that incoming committee really never got a chance because there was infighting as to whether they did not like certain members of the party. I think that is where the entire pressure started from, but it got to escalate uh, and exacerbate it uh, by the investigations that were taking place regarding his wife, Maisaya Tabani, who was alleged to have been involved in, especially the mobile phone of the prime minister was used, but which is mostly known that it was used by the wife. This pressure, I think with the infighting within his own party must have escalated to this him intending to retire in a short period. And that's because Ms. Prime Minister Tabane is seen as something of a strong man within the kingdom. But just how much external pressure was there on him to step down as well? Because we understand that there's an envoy from South Africa in Maseru today. Yes, the envoy from South Africa really was invited as neighbours simply to inform them on the developments that are going. You will understand President Ramaphosa is also a facilitator envoy by SADC. But this time he was here just as a, a neighbor to come and see even if, if he can assist on any matters, but as a neighbor just to know the developments going on. Not really as a big brother coming to oversee the events going on. Now, we, we know about the events that, you know, have occurred there in the last couple of days. You know, the, the, the Prime Minister's wife, the First Lady, uh, in effect, going missing or refusing to turn up for police questioning. But how much, how much, and I know we have to be careful here, how much does stepping down point, uh, uh, if you like, a guilty finger at this family? I really think it's conglomeration of a whole lot of factors, really. It cannot really be merely pointed to one. But remember, his own party was already going through a bit of a turmoil. 
And the opposition was quite not winking. They were looking at an opportunity to either find a new coalition. So either way, he, I think the best decision was for him to regroup his own party such that if he does intend to step down, at least he can do a smooth transition and his party can still stay in power. So I think the decision came as that, as a bit of an amicable situation, saying, look, it's best if you step down within your own party, then things can sort of be under control, rather than if it has to, be, you have to be pushed out of the situation. I, I think the sense came from that wisdom. Okay, Rapalang Radebe speaking to us there from Maseru Lesotho. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, following talks in Washington, Egypt, Ethiopia and Sudan have reached an initial agreement over what will be Africa's biggest hydroelectric dam, a $4 billion project on the Blue Nile in Ethiopia. They've agreed the dam is to be filled in stages and only during the rainy season. That's something that Egypt, which is downstream, hopes will help avoid droughts. The dam is vital to help supply Ethiopia with power, but according to the draft deal, it will have to use it with certain safeguards. The project has sparked a diplomatic crisis as Egypt is concerned that the dam could restrict supplies of Nile water on which the population of more than 100 million people is almost entirely dependent. The BBC's Emmanuel Gunza has more. It's going to be Africa's biggest hydropower dam, an ambitious feat that is close to completion after years of dispute. But now after holding talks in Washington, Egypt, Ethiopia and Sudan have agreed that the filling of this mega dam will be done in stages and only during the rainy seasons of July and August. This will take care of Ethiopia's concerns of starting to generate electricity from the dam as quickly as possible. The initial agreement, on the other hand, gives assurances to Egypt, which has always insisted on guarantees on the amount of water allowed to downstream countries, particularly during droughts. This has been a sticking point throughout the four rounds of talks that have ended with no deal. Wednesday's statement, however, is short on the finer details of this particular concern a clear indication that much more work needs to go into the final agreement, which will be signed on the 28th or 29th of January, when ministers from the three countries meet again in Washington. The final agreement is not only important in ending the tensions between Ethiopia and Egypt, it will no doubt have a huge bearing on how the other eight countries on the Nile Basin choose to exploit the River Nile in the future. However, the devil remains in the detail. Imanuli Gunza, BBC News. So what's been the reaction from Cairo? Here's the BBC's Salina Bill. The tone here in Egypt is positive and quite hopeful because finally the Egyptians and the, the Ethiopians have managed to achieve a breakthrough in the negotiations. What we understand so far is that they agreed on filling the reservoir over stages during the wet season between July and August. Further discussions are going to be held before the end of this month in Washington and both parties hope to reach a final deal uh, by then. For over a long period of time, the negotiations have reached the deadlock, but finally things seem to be a bit hopeful. The Egyptians are quite worried that the Renaissance Dam might reduce their share of water, and the River Nile is the main source of water of 100 million Egyptians living here. So we'll just have to wait and see what's going to happen in Washington on the 28th and the 25th and the 29th of January. But so far, the tone here in Egypt is quite positive. Salina Bill in Cairo. Let's take a quick look now at other stories making the headlines across Africa and the rest of the world. The U.S. Senate has officially started the impeachment trial of President Trump formally accepting the articles of impeachment. The U.S. president is accused of abuse of power and obstructing Congress. It's alleged he tried to pressurize Ukraine to dig dirt on one of his political rivals, Joe Biden. Donald Trump insists he did nothing wrong. Germany says the Libyan rebel leader Khalifa Haftar has agreed to abide by a ceasefire with the forces of the UN-recognized government in Tripoli. The German foreign minister said General Haftar was also in principle ready to participate in a Libyan peace conference in Berlin on Sunday. 
The billionaire daughter of Angola's ex-president Isabel dos Santos has told the BBC she might run for president in the next election in 2022. She's faced allegations of nepotism and corruption and last month the court froze her assets in Angola following allegations she'd lost the state more than a billion dollars. She denies the accusations. 45 million people in southern Africa are in urgent need of food, uh, food aid rather, due to drought, flooding and economic hardship. That's according to the UN's World Food Programme. They say that unless uh, more, they more than doubled their reserves of emergency funding to just under half a billion US dollars, countries like Eswatini, Lesotho and Malawi will suffer if there's another poor harvest this year. And a huge diamond unearthed in Botswana in April has been sold to French luxury fashion house Louis Vuitton for an undisclosed sum. The 1,758-carat stone is reportedly the second largest found in, this, uh, in a century. It's been named Sowelo, meaning rare find in Setswana language, and came from the Karowe mine in Letlahane, central Botswana. Let's go to Kenya now, where a group of women and girls have been blocked from boarding a flight to the United Arab Emirates because authorities feared they were being trafficked. They were intercepted at the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport in Nairobi and have been returned to the Ugandan authorities. Catherine Biaruhanga has more. The women and girls have been brought here to the capital where they're being interviewed by investigators as well as receiving counselling. On Sunday, there was a joint operation by Kenyan and Ugandan authorities in Nairobi to rescue the group. They were then driven in buses and brought to the border between the two countries and then on to Kampala. Police say of the 91 people they freed, just under half of them are minors, some as young as 13 years of age. Six of them, including one girl, are believed to be pregnant. An anti-human trafficking campaigner who helped uncover this supposed trafficking ring told me that even more girls and women were found during the sting operation in Nairobi and that in fact most of them ran away when security officials arrived. A Ugandan woman believed to be one of the traffickers is in detention in Nairobi. Two other suspects are on the run. The woman in question is alleged to have sold some of the girls and women to undercover informants for $150. Most of the people in this group are believed to be from the Karamoja region in northeastern Uganda. This is the most underdeveloped part of the country and Karamojong are often trafficked either here to the capital or to neighboring Kenya. The campaigner involved in this operation told me Many of the girls and women were visibly angry at being taken away from Nairobi. They thought they'd be able to find jobs to better their lives. Catherine Biarohanga there. Now, this is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. With me, Peter Okwacha, still to come. The draw for the Australian Open was held today. Find out who Africa's only female representative in the singles will be playing. I'm Peter Okwache, the top story this hour. Lesotho's Prime Minister is planning to step down. The decision comes amid a political crisis over the murder of his estranged wife. Ethiopia's economy has been growing rapidly in the past decade, with recently announced financial packages from the World Bank and the IMF amounting to around $6 billion. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has big plans for the future, including privatizing the country's telecoms, energy and sugar industries. However, even if an economy grows and everyone has more money in their pockets, if there is a shortage of goods, the price of those goods will rise as well. That's simple inflation. And it's this soaring cost of living which is putting the strain on ordinary Ethiopians. The BBC's Kalkidan Yebeltal reports. Addis Ababa is a rapidly changing city. For the past decade, it has been the centre of Ethiopia's economy, one of the fastest growing in the continent. But not without a price. Residents say rising cost of living is making life increasingly difficult. 
And recently, as inflation continues to be in the double digits for months, bringing food to the table has not been an easy task, especially for lower income families. I used to eat good food. My children were full. But now it is not good. It is a difficult time. It makes people tired. I am exhausted from struggling every day. In December, year-on-year -year headline inflation, which indicates the cost of living, was around 20%, driven largely by an increase in the price of food items, a problem often admitted by senior government officials, including Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. When we ask what the basic issues causing inflation are, we find the first one to be house rent, which is rising every day and creating a lot of pain for the working population. The second is food. Since Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed came to power in 2018, Ethiopia has embarked on an economic reform that includes opening up of some sectors to foreign investors. But these efforts are marred with key economic problems like foreign currency shortage and rising inflation that continues to test the government. As Ethiopia is grappling with a surge of ethnic conflicts across the country, some say the economy is not getting the attention it deserves. There is fundamental imbalances uh, in the economy. Uh, what, what does that mean is particularly, you know, we have, the government has a huge drive to have a big growth, a large growth, right? Uh, um, so, but the, the target growth rate is not compatible with the food supply uh, and the foreign exchange generating capacity of the country. With a looming general election this year, the burden of inflation on ordinary people might prove to be a decisive issue. But until politicians come up with a solution, people like Etalem have to work out how to make ends meet. Kalkidan Ibeltal, BBC News, Addis Ababa. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. It's now time for some sports. Mimi, what have you got? Lots of different sports today. The Confederation of African Football has rearranged the continent's qualifying campaigns for the 2022 World Cup and the 2021 Africa Cup of Nations. It follows Wednesday's decision to move the 2021 Nations Cup in Cameroon, which was meant to begin in June to the start of January. Nations Cup qualifiers had been due to begin in August, but will now start in March. Qualifiers for the 2022 World Cup have been postponed to October to accommodate the change. All right, Aston Villa are hoping to complete a $13 million deal for gang striker Mbwana Samata as manager Dean Smith moves to strengthen his attacking options. The club wanted to bolster this area after losing Wesley for the rest of the season with a knee injury sustained at Burnley on New Year's Day. The 27-year-old Tanzania international who scored against Liverpool at Anfield in this season's Champions League group stage has emerged as Villa's target but transfer details need to be agreed and with Samata requiring a work permit he will not be available in time for their visit to Brighton on Saturday. Villa are willing to part with striker Jonathan Kodja. Arsenal have failed in their bid to overturn a red card that was given to their captain, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, during their one-all draw away to Crystal Palace. The Gabon international, who is the club's top scorer, will miss the club's next three games, which include their match against Sheffield United this weekend, as well as to Chelsea and their FA Cup fourth-round tie against Bournemouth. Um, he's been superb under me. He's training really well. He's working so hard, he's scoring goals and um, and probably has been the most uh, important player of the team. So to lose him, obviously, it's, um, it's really bad news for us. To tennis, we are just a few days away from the first Grand Slam of the year. And so the draw of the Australian Open was held today in Melbourne. The only African female in a singles draw is Tunisia's Onze Jabeur. She will face Britain's Johanna Kanta, who is seeded 12th while Jabeur isn't seeded. In the men's, South Africa's Kevin Anderson will have to wait to find out who he will face on the qualifiers that are underway. His fellow compatriot Lloyd Harris has been drawn against number 14 seed Diego Schwartzman of Argentina. 
finally, Somalia is one of the six teams competing at the Afro Basket Zone 5 free qualifiers in Nairobi. The team lost their first two matches against South Sudan and Burundi. The qualifiers are seen as a way to try and revive the sport in their country. The position is tough, man. Like, there's no funding, you know? We're funding ourselves. Every player paid for their own ticket to come from Canada, U.S., Australia, you know, and uh, it's, 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 uh, it shows how much we want to represent our country because we're paying out of pocket, you know, and we don't have no time to practice together, no time to compete together. We've only been together for four, four or five days, less than a week, you know, and you, you can't expect to win, but we have talented guys on our squad. And that's all the sport. Back to you, Peter. Many thanks, Mimi. Thank you very much. Now, if I asked you to imagine what a female rapper looks like, chances are you're not picturing the woman in the screens behind me. She's Aminata Gay from Senegal, but she goes by the stage name Mina Lavoile, which means Mina the Veiled One. And it's her use of the veil while she's on the mic, which means she comes in for a lot of criticism in her home country. She says it doesn't make any difference to her ability to rap, and she's hoping to challenge stereotypes and embody the new face of women's hip hop in Senegal. Here's her story. Mon histoire, c'est que je voulais faire euh, de la musique, mais je ne pouvais pas le faire à cause de mon voile. Et le rap, c'était euh, la musique qui m'a parlé le plus. On me disait qu'on ne peut pas être voilé et, et rappeuse en même temps. Je suis voilée depuis, depuis toute petite. Pourquoi arrêter d'être voilée à cause de la musique et À la place de mettre des perruques, à la place de se raser, à la place de mettre des casquettes, mon voile, c'est mon style. Quand je suis euh, Mina, je suis ni chrétienne, ni musulmane, ni animiste et tout. Je suis juste artiste musicienne. D'une part, il y a des personnes qui m'encouragent par rapport à ça, qui me disent que le, le val n'a rien à voir avec euh, faire de la musique. D'autre part, il y a des insultes. Il y en a qui vont jusqu'à me dire que je suis l'incarnation du Satan et tout, et que je suis là pour gâter la religion et tout. Je me dis que les personnes, les gens qui, qui m'insultent dans, dans le net et tout, n'ont pas compris euh, le message que je véhicule. Je fais partie d'une famille où euh, la fille n'a pas le droit de sortir euh, au-delà de 19h. Et moi, je peux rester une semaine au dehors euh, en train de faire des concerts et autres. Donc euh, mon père n'avait pas carrément accepté ça là. Au fur et à mesure, il a vu que c'est ce que je voulais et que après tout ce qu'ils ont fait pour que j'arrête, je n'ai pas arrêté. Donc euh, de plus en plus, euh, ils me soutiennent par rapport à ça et euh, ils commencent à accepter yeah. ma musique. Le fait d'être rappeuse et, euh, et voilée inspire euh, bon nombre de jeunes, surtout euh, les jeunes filles voilées. Des fois, je reçois des messages genre euh, c'est à cause de toi que j'arrive à aller à des concerts. D'habitude, les filles voilées n'allaient pas dans ces lieux parce que c'est un peu mal perçu. De plus en plus, je vois des voilées venir à des concerts et euh, vivre leur vie pleinement, et ne se souciant pas d'être voilées ou autre. Par rapport aux filles qui veulent faire de la musique ou bien veulent faire autre chose, peu importe que les gens veulent qu'elles le fassent ou non, l'essentiel c'est de croire en ses rêves et de le faire et de foncer et de travailler pour que les rêves se, se réalisent. Mina la voile, watch out for her. Just before we go, another look at some breaking news in the last hour. And the U.S. Senate has officially started the impeachment trial of President Trump, formally accepting the articles of impeachment. The U.S. president is accused of abuse of power and obstructing Congress. It's alleged he tried to pressurize Ukraine to dig dirt on one of his political rivals, Joe Biden. That's it on Focus on Africa for today. Thanks for watching and uh, see you again very soon. Bye.